Happy Sabbath, everyone. It's a blessing to be here once again and have the opportunity to share God's word. And let's keep in our minds our brethren, as it was mentioned in the prayer, you know, from Ukraine and also Russia. You know, they won't have the opportunity we're having today because meetings have been banned at the moment, you know. So let's pray for them and for the young people, especially because, you know, um, in time of war, they need young people, right? So they're going to be forced to go there and serve the country. And let's pray for them, for the brethren, that they remain faithful, you know, to the principles that we know. Again, history repeats itself, right? Brethren forced to kill brethren. You know, so let's pray for them that the Lord may give them the courage and faithfulness to the end. The topic for today is predestinated. You know, Brother Luke read this beautiful Bible verse in Romans. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. You know, sometimes we hear this word predestination or predestinated. But what is it actually? What is predestination? You know, throughout the centuries, theologians, lay people have argued over this doctrine. And if this doctrine could possibly be true. When you go to the internet, actually, it's something interesting, you know, because you just type on Google predestination. A few things will come up, but they can be misleading, actually. For example, I just picked two of them. The first one is in Britannica.com, and it reads, Predestination in Christianity, the doctrine that God has eternally chosen those whom he intends to save. Isn't it interesting? But is it biblical? Has God chosen just a few people that he wants to save? All right? The next one that we find is um, GodQuestions.org. It says... Predestination is the biblical doctrine that God in His sovereignty chooses certain individuals to be saved. Isn't it interesting? That's what you will find if you go to the internet. Right? Now, if this type of predestination is true, we have a few questions here. Right? What happens to free will? Because we understand that we are given free will, right? We have choice, don't we? Do we have choice? Yes, we do. Or are we just puppets on a string, you know, doing what God had ordained in eternity past? Are we just puppets doing that? No, right? Another question that comes to my mind is, does God predestine some people to go to heaven? Then if he does, does he also predestinate others to go to eternal damnation? So those questions need to be answered, right? Now, why bother with evangelism? Since whoever is going to be saved will be saved eventually. Right? Why do we need to evangelize the world? Since God has predetermined already people who are going to go to heaven and some others to go to eternal damnation. You know, these are the things that we need to consider. And then something else. If God predestines some people to eternal damnation, how can they be guilty of sins? Right? How can they be guilty since God has already predestined them to die? You see? Now, this is just some definitions you find on the internet. Now, the Greek word, I like to show you know, the original here. I use this um, software, which is, which is according to Bible software. It's just, you know, to show that this is how they write it and what it means. So it, it's actually a compound word, which has a preposition and a verb also. And it means to limit in advance, to predetermine, determine before, ordain, or predestine. All right? So what I want to make clear here today is that predestine or predestination is a biblical word. All right? Predestination is biblical. But not the way you find it on the internet. All right? But it is biblical. So no one can get around it. All right? How many times does this word come up in the Bible? Four times only. Predestined. 
All right, four times only. Two times in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30, and the other one in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 and 11. And that's it. You know, when the Apostle Peter talks about Paul, he says, the Apostle Paul writes difficult things to understand. Isn't it true? You know, when you read Romans, there are some things there that, man, it's so hard to understand. And imagine Peter, you know, reading the writings of the Apostle Paul. He was a former fisherman trying to understand the words of a scholar, you know. So you see here that the Apostle was given this light, you know, to give to the world. But not to be something difficult because it was something to be easy to understand, right? But where does it come? Where does this definition of predestination that we find on the internet come from? You know, have you heard of John Calvin? Yeah, Calvinism, right? He is the originator of Calvinism. So he, um, he was a theological uh, scholar and also the lead, one of the leaders of the Reformation. He was born in the south of France. And he was persecuted as well. So he was a Catholic, um, almost becoming a priest, actually. But then because he started studying the Bible, he was persecuted. And he was chased out of France. He went to Geneva. You know, the reformers received light as well for their time, right? A present truth. Not everything, but a present truth for the time. And he helped lots of people in Geneva especially, and also he went back to France and helped his people to understand the truth. But you know, there are some things that sometimes we, when we study the Bible, we come to conclusions because of what? Maybe context, without context sometimes, you know? And he talked about these few points, and I'm going to mention them. Each of them is actually a study in itself, but I'm just going to mention them. He talked about the supreme sovereignty of God. Is God supreme? Is God sovereign? He is. But, you know, do you think that God's sovereignty has limits? What do you reckon? Yes or no? no? All right. Let me ask you a couple of questions then. Can God create another God? Yes or no? Can God create another God? No. Yes, he can. Because he's God. But he doesn't. Why? Because he himself put a limit to his sovereignty. Another question. Can God create a stone so big and so heavy that he cannot lift? Yes, he can. But he doesn't. Because he limited. He That's all right. That's all right. So, the only thing why I mention it, it is because God can put limits to Himself as well. But He can do everything if He wants. All right? So, I understand the point of view. Okay? It's an illustration for us to understand. All right? Now, He talked also about predestination, the one we saw before. All right? Then he talked about the total depravity of man. Also, unconditional election, which means basically, you know, there is no condition. Everyone can be elected, no matter who you are. If you're going through a wrong path of life, you can be elected as well. That's what he was teaching. Then, limited atonement. He also explained that the sacrifice of Christ was not for the whole universe. All right? Then he talked about irresistible grace. Can we resist grace? What does it mean, irresistible grace? He was saying that grace is so powerful that you cannot resist it. But can we deny or resist grace? We can. You see? 
But this was the teaching and also the perseverance of the saints, which was once saved, always saved. All right? So these were the points that he was teaching. All right? But then someone else comes up in the story, Jacobus Arminius. And he, because of his last name, you know, Arminianism comes and it's based on the views of this uh, theologian, Jacobus Arminius, which was Dutch. And he studied under John Calvin's son-in-law in Geneva. But you know, he was a very strict Calvinist. All right? He followed all these doctrines that we read before. But later, he studied the Book of Romans. And when he studied the Book of Romans, he was led to doubt and reject of many Calvinistic doctrines. Because he studied the book of Romans. Now, what does he teach? Or what did he teach? He said that conditional election is based on God's foreknowledge. Right? Then, man's free will through prevenient grace to cooperate with God in salvation. So he talks about cooperation with God. All right? Prevenient grace meaning a preparatory grace, you know, that God gives you grace to cooperate with him. He gives you the power to cooperate with him. Then he also taught that Christ's sacrifice was universal. Then he talked about resistible grace. He actually explained that we can resist grace because we are given free choice, free will. And then he said salvation could be or can be potentially lost. Can we lose salvation? Yes, we can. You know, he went and studied things from the Bible, right, to prove Calvin wrong. But the other one, Calvin, also studied the Bible and came to those conclusions. But he was wrong. Now, can we study the Bible and come to wrong conclusions then? We can if we are not led by the Holy Spirit, you know, or if we are led just by our own understanding and thoughts. So this is just an introduction, all right? Some questions were asked just for an illustration for us to understand a few things. Now, in Genesis 18.25, we read that, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So is God righteous or not? Is he fair? Yes, he is. So God will do the right thing always. All right, let's keep that in mind. God is righteous. He will do always the right thing in his justice and in his mercy. Now, in Romans 8, 29, we read something else. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So you see, he predestinated people to be conformed to the image of his son. But what is then predestination, you know, according to the Bible? Well, you know, let me tell you this. Jacobus Arminius got it right. You know, his teachings are according to the Bible because he didn't uh, overrule free will, all right? And he explained that we can lose salvation and we can see that grace can be resisted as well. God knows who is going to be saved, right? Doesn't he know? He knows. From the beginning. But he hasn't finger-picked people, you know. Okay, you are going to be saved. You are not. Because, you know, here so far, we see that Calvin would say, even if, if you are doing God's will, if God has determined for you to get lost, you will be lost. And if God has determined someone else who was doing wrong things, if God has determined for that person to be saved, that person will be saved. That was the teaching of Calvin. But that is not a biblical teaching. All right? Now, in the, in the book, The Gospel Herald, it's a magazine actually, in June 11, 1902, from the Spirit of Prophecy, we read, The predestination or election of which God speaks includes all who will accept Christ as a personal Savior, who will return to their loyalty, to perfect obedience to all God's commandments. 
So this is predestination. All right? What does it include? Acceptance, which is the condition, you know, to accept. For example, if I had a present here or, or a gift, what is the first thing that you would do to have that gift with you? Receive it, right? Before opening, you have to receive it, right? Before saying thank you, you have to receive it. So basically, salvation also needs to be accepted first. And then it says, this is the effectual salvation of a peculiar people chosen by God from among men. All who are willing to be saved by Christ are the elect of God. It is the obedient who are predestinated from the foundation of the world. So you see, predestination is biblical. It exists, all right? But we choose. It is not God that chooses you who is going to be saved, right? But we choose to be chosen according to the Bible. In Romans 8.30, it goes beyond and says, Moreover, moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, then them he also glorified. You know, here a few step-by-step -step process, right? We have here predestinated, then called, then justified, and then glorified, according to the last verse. Now, we have been predestinated, it says, from the foundation of the world because of the sacrifice of Christ, who was also, according to Revelation 13, he died also, right? It says that the Lamb of God died from the foundation of the world as well. So due to his sacrifice, we have been predestinated. God predestinated everyone to be saved. But does everyone want to be saved? Do you want to be saved? So you have to be willing, right? And you have to accept. Now, in Selected Messages, book one, we read in page 389, calling and justification are not one and the same thing. Calling is the drawing of the sinner to Christ and is a work wrought by the Holy Spirit upon the heart, convicting of sin and inviting to repentance. So you see, calling and justification, different things. You can receive the invitation, right? You can be invited. But if you don't accept, how are you going to be justified? What does justification, what does justification mean? Forgiveness, right? When we talked about justification, it is forgiveness. But then, we have this picture now of predestination. But is it possible to be saved we are predestined to be saved, right? But is it possible to be saved without Jesus? Can someone go to heaven without Jesus? <coughs> According to the Bible, it says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, right? So it is only through Jesus. So I'm going to read here a few verses. Please bear with me. Ephesians chapter 1, from verse 1 to 11. So from verse 2 to 11, it says, Grace be to you. And peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Then, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So you see here, Ephesians will mention Christ all the way through. It is only through Christ that we can receive spiritual blessings. Then, according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. You see? Since when have we been chosen? From the foundation of the world, according to the Bible. But what is the purpose of being chosen? <coughs> to become holy and without blame. To have the life of Jesus Christ in our lives. <coughs> Ephesians 1.5 says having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. We are adopted. You know, we talked about this a few lessons ago, a few Sabbaths ago as well, you know. We have been adopted. When a father, a mother adopts a little child, 
Do they love them as if he or she were their own child? Yes or no? Yes. They become their child, you know. And we've been adopted as well. Through Jesus Christ, okay? Ephesians 1, 6 reads, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. You see, again, accepted in the Beloved, in Jesus Christ. Verse 7, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Again, Jesus Christ here in the middle. Forgiveness of sin according to the riches of His grace. Now, how do we get redemption? It says here, through His blood. All right, through His sacrifice. Verse 8, Wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He hath purposed in Himself. So you see, brethren, I'm reading a few verses here just for us to understand that predestination or election or salvation or redemption, it's only through Jesus Christ. If we are trying to obtain salvation on our own, we are not going to be saved. Because salvation, it's only through Jesus Christ. Not because of the good works you do. The good works we do are just the result, are consequences of being saved. Ephesians 1.10 reads, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in whom? In Christ. Both without, which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. The heavenly family and the earthly family will come together in Jesus Christ. So you see, brethren, everything is through Jesus Christ alone. In the last verse here, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. So, predestination and election is possible, but it's only through Jesus Christ. In the Spirit of Prophecy, again, uh, Signs of the Times, January 2nd, 1893, it reads, in the council of heaven, provision was made that men, though transgressors, should not perish in their disobedience, but through faith in Christ as their substitute and surety, might become the elect of God, predestinated unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Do you think God did everything he could? To save humanity. You know, I don't have the quote here, but the Spirit of Prophecy says that the hoarded love of God, the accumulated love of God, was given to the world in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Everything He could do, He did to save you and me. What was the accusation of Satan in heaven? The accusation was that God was selfish. Was God selfish? Can someone who is selfish give a son to die? So it was proven that God is not selfish. And He did everything He could to save you and me. But are there going to be people who are going to get lost? Will there be people who will get lost? Yes. But will it be God's fault? Not really. Let me read this for you. Those who perish will perish because they refuse to be adopted as children of God through Christ Jesus. So you see here, we talked about accept and now we talk about refuse, reject. Because we have the choice, right? God respects your choice. And that is what he, it makes him God. Because he respects your choice. Could he force everyone to accept him? Yes, he could do that. But he doesn't. Because he wants obedience out of love and not out of fear. And that's what he gave to the angels in heaven as well. 
And that's what He gives you today as well. And I pray that you not refuse God's mercy. You know, the world we are living now, COVID is coming down, and then something else happened, you know? And then something else will happen again. Those are just signs, you know? But it depends on us, actually, to make it to heaven or not. Because God has done everything He could do. And you know what? In your experience, in my experience, we can see that God is still working. You know, He still does something else through the Holy Spirit. But we can also reject the work of the Holy Spirit. We can choose. What are you going to choose? To accept or to refuse? That which will make a man acceptable to God is the imparted grace of Christ through faith in His name. No dependence can be placed in works or in happy flights of feelings as evidence that men are chosen of God, for the elect are chosen through Christ. You know, sometimes we may think that because we keep the Sabbath, we're going to go to heaven. Or because I give my tithes back to the church, I'm going to make it to heaven. Or because I'm vegetarian or vegan, you know, I'm going to make it to heaven. Or because I help others, I'm going to make it to heaven. If salvation would be in that way, then many people will go to heaven, actually. Many people. But, according to this quote here, it is not because of our works. It is because of Jesus Christ. Now, keeping the Sabbath, giving your tithes back, following the light of health reform, helping others, is the consequence of salvation. We do those things because we believed that Christ has saved us. And I say this by faith, not by, you know, just to show off. We can have that faith that Jesus has saved us. We can have that assurance. And the result is going to be good works in our lives. Now, another question. Can we be saved without good works? No. Because salvation is linked with good works. It's like saying, you know, can I be saved without obeying God's word? No. But my obedience doesn't buy salvation, right? But faith in Christ gives me salvation. And the consequence is good works. So, you know, I need to stop here a little bit because many times, I don't know, it, it's my experience, all right? Many times we tried and strived, you know, to do good works, to keep the law, to be faithful. And I don't know if it happened to you, but it happened to me. We fail. We feel like, when am I going to reach the standard that God wants for me? You know why we fail? It is because we depend on our own works and not on Christ. But the moment we ask the Lord, Lord, give me strength, give me faith, Give me your obedience. That's the moment we become obedient according to God's will. But the moment we go on our own, trying to be faithful, trying to keep the commandments, trying to help others, that's when we fail. Why? Because we're trying to do those things without Jesus Christ. Brethren, it is not about us at all. It is about Jesus Christ in us. The hope of glory. So basically, when we do God's will and good works, it is Christ working in us and through us to bless the world. But you have to receive Him. I have to receive Him. John chapter 1, verse 12 reads, But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Do you want that power? Do we want that power? Imagine. Power to become 
the sons of God. But first of all, before receiving the power, we need to receive Him as a personal Savior. You know, if you study the, if you read this first prophecy, you will find many times that God's servant says that we need to accept Jesus as a personal Savior, not only as the Savior of the world, but as a personal Savior. My question to you is, have you accepted Christ as your personal Savior? Do you believe that? Do we believe that? Do you believe that He can save you? God, in giving His only begotten Son to die on Calvary's cross, has made it possible for all men to be saved. It's beautiful, you know. The gospel is beautiful, brethren. Everyone we see on the streets can be saved. Everyone. But for salvation to become effective, we need to accept. If we don't accept, it's like, you know, I, I put the, the gift here and it's for you. But if you don't accept or take it, then you will enjoy that gift, you know. God has given salvation for you. Take it. Accept it today, you know, because we don't know what's going to happen in the world, brethren. But of one thing, we have to be sure that we have accepted Jesus as a personal Savior. And the, the, the world will see it in our lives. Our fruits will show if we have accepted the Savior or not. So that is in regards to predestination being only through Jesus Christ. But there are conditions, you know, of eternal life. Do you remember the, the, young, the young man who came to Jesus and asked him a question, you know? Good master, he said. Do you remember the question? What did he ask? What shall I do to inherit eternal life? What did Jesus say to him? Keep the commandments. Oh, now I'm confused. Do I have to keep the commandments to be saved then? Because Jesus told him, you know, keep the commandments to inherit eternal life. But now we have understood that, right? It is first to accept Jesus, and then you will keep the commandments. Now, in John chapter 14, 15, we read, If you love me, keep my commandments. Church, do you love Jesus Christ? Can I hear an amen? amen. What does Jesus tell you? <coughs> keep the commandments. There is no way around, around it, you know. We cannot avoid this. Then in the same chapter, verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. It talks about the commandments, a condition, right? And in verse 23. If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and, will, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Again, obedience. And in John 14, 24, He that loveth me not, keep, he that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. So you see, brethren, we cannot avoid obedience. It is a condition from the beginning. It was a condition from Adam and Eve. And you know what? Let's go beyond. Perfect obedience. Now, as human beings, as human mortal beings, can we keep the commandments? Yes or no? No. So whenever someone from a different denomination comes to you and say... It is impossible to keep the commandments. You have to agree with them. Because on our own, we cannot. And if you think you can, you are deceived. It is only through the power of Jesus Christ that we can keep the commandments. Remember John 1, 12? We need to receive Him for Him to give us power. All right? We need the power to obey 
Now, here are the conditions. Review and Herald, September 28, 1897. Here are the conditions upon which every soul may be elected to eternal life. Your obedience to God's commandments will prove that you are predestinated to a glorious inheritance. How do we prove we are predestinated? Through obedience in Jesus Christ. Search the scriptures and you will find that not a son or daughter of Adam is elected to be saved in disobedience to God's commandments. You see? Predestination has this condition. Obedience. Not on your own. You don't need to strive. You know? Once I, I, I heard this sermon from a preacher. He was saying, we don't need to strive or be worried about keeping the commandments. But we need to actually have a true relationship with Christ. Because the consequence of that relationship with Christ is going to be obedience. Obedience to the commandments of God. If we focus on our relationship, studying God's word, praying. How much time do we spend praying? Remember the conference last year on prayer? We had here in this church for three days. Sometimes, you know, we pray this takeaway prayer, right? When we ask only, God, give me this and that. I need this and that. But we don't give thanks to God. Is that communion with God? It's not communion, right? Or sometimes we, we rush into doing our stuff during the day. And we don't spend not even five minutes. Have you ever timed your, your prayer? I'm not saying that you have to pray for two or three hours. You know, our Lord Jesus prayed for all night through. But do we have quality prayer? Do we really open our hearts to God? Do we really hear God's voice when we pray? Brethren, communion with God gives us perfect obedience. This obedience that we're talking about, perfect obedience. But you know, faith is required, right? We need faith to do that. Because without faith... It is impossible to what? To please Him. Hebrews 11.6 And for whatsoever is not a faith is sin. You know that even atheists have faith? Do you know that? Everyone in the world was given a portion of faith. For example, when people go to the market, you know, these days people buy organic stuff. But do you, know, do you really know that the stuff people buy is organic? Have you read on the news that in Australia, three weeks ago, the uh, Food and Health uh, Administration found that some products on the stores and the supermarkets that had the label organic were not organic? Weeks ago, in Australia, one developed country, you know, when we go to the market, we buy stuff and we exercise faith, right? Because we think, okay, well, maybe it's true, right? But we need faith. Everyone, when, goes, when they go to the market, they need to exercise faith. Because we believe, you know, okay, must be good. So, faith is essential in order to the, in order to the keeping of the law of God. So, if faith is essential for simple things in our life, much more... To keep the commandments. If we keep the commandments without faith, we are, we are going to fail. Faith in whom? In Jesus Christ. So it is possible to keep the commandments, my brethren. But in Jesus. It is all about Him, brethren. Now, when we talk about predestination, we cannot avoid but talk about free will too. And we have touched this already. But God has given us the opportunity to accept or to reject. Which one are we going to choose? We're going to accept or reject the opportunity to be saved. I think I shared this before, but if you haven't heard this story, I, I, I shared this a couple of years ago, but um, there was this wise man living in the mountains. You know, he was very famous in an Asian country. And then he had students, you know. 
um, how do you call it? pupils. Right? And one of the students come, you know, and say, he said to his friends, I'm going to prove our master wrong. He's not wise as he seems to be or as he says he is. And then he said, I'm going to grab, I'm going to catch a bird, I'm going to hide it behind my back, and I'm going to ask one question to my master. I'm going to ask him this, is the bird alive? If he says the bird is alive, I'm going to kill the bird. And if he says the bird is dead, then I'm going to let it live. He went to the master up in the mountain and asked him, you know, Master, I have something in my hands. It's a bird. Is it alive or dead? You know what the answer of the master was? The answer is in your hands, he said to him. And that was it. The answer is in your hands. You know, brethren, God has given us free will for us to exercise it. The answer is in your hands. We can choose what we want to do. You know? He that believeth on the Son of God hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So, we can choose believe or not to believe, right? According to this verse. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. So, many people, many Christians in the world today call the Lord, Lord, right? But, will everyone be in heaven? No. It is not enough, brethren, to come to church then. It is not enough to, to call the Lord, Lord, you know? We have to accept Jesus and accept His life in our life. Revelation twenty two fourteen, Blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Blessed are you, it says. So yes, we need to keep the commandments. It's true. It is a condition of eternal life. But not on our own. Because Jesus will give us the power. We have been predestinated for eternal life. But it's up to us. You know, I told you, I think, before. One expression in English that I don't like is this expression. It's up to you. When people tell me it's up to you, it's like, man, I don't like it, to be honest with you. You know why? Because it means that I have to make the decision, right? If something goes wrong, then who is going to be blamed? Yourself or myself, you know? But also the Bible gives us that, you know? It's up to you. But we have all these beautiful promises. God has done everything He could do to save you and me. But He respects your free will. My appeal today, brethren, is that we accept the Lord Jesus Christ. That we accept to be predestinated to eternal life. Choose you today. For I and my house will serve the Lord. That's my wish and prayer. And I really pray that all of us have this experience. Choose you this day to be saved. Amen.